Hey, what's going on? In this video, I'll be setting up OSPF using real Cisco equipment. Here's the topology. This is what I'll be replicating. Here's my 3560 switch. Up here are my router 3, 2, and 1. These will be running OSPF to communicate with each other. Now, let's dive into the configuration. Let's start configuring our first interface on router 1. I'll be setting G0 slash 0 to IP address 192.168.11 slash 24. While I configure this, let's quickly talk about OSPF. OSPF or Open Shortest Path First is a link state routing protocol used in larger networks to dynamically Find the best path for data to advertise each other. What I mean is, instead of manually configuring static routes between every router, OSPF allows them to automatically discover and learn about each other. Here's how it works. Each router running OSPF sends out hello packets to check for other OSPF neighbors. Once they find each other, they exchange link state advertisements, sharing information about the networks they know. Pretty cool, huh? Now that G0 slash 0 is set up, let's move on to G0 slash 1. This interface will be assigned 192.168.21 slash 24. Just like before, I'm using the no shutdown command to bring the interface up. By default, the interfaces on Cisco routers are administratively down, so we have to manually enable them. Now that I configured both interfaces, let's verify our setup by using the show IP interface brief command. Both interfaces are showing down, but that's because we haven't yet configured the other end of the connection. Alright, we're done configuring router 1 for now. Next, I'll be moving over to router 2, so I need to switch my console cable to it. For those new to this, the console cable is what allows me to directly access and configure the router. Since I'm not using remote access like SSH or Telnet, I have to manually switch between devices when configuring them. You can see here that the router's name has changed to router 2. Now that we're connected, I'll start by configuring G0 slash 1 with the IP address 192.168.12 with the subnet mask of 255.255.255.0. This interface connects router 2 to router 1, allowing them to communicate once OSPF is enabled. Again, I'm using the no shutdown command to bring the interface up. Now, router 2 has an active connection to router 1 on the 192.168.10.24 network. The link should come up. And there you go. I want to verify that everything is set up correctly. Here, I can see that G0 slash 1 has the IP address of 192.168.12 and its status and protocol are both up. Alright, router 2 is set up and verified. Now, I'm moving on to router 3, so I need to switch my console cable over. You can see here that the router's name has changed to router 3. The first step is configuring G0 slash 0 with the IP address 192.168.12 slash 24. This will allow router 3 to communicate with the rest of the network. Now I'm setting up gigabit internet 0 slash 1 with the IP address 10111 slash 24. This network will serve as the connection point for all edge devices such as PCs, servers, and other client devices.
I'm going to run a quick check using the show IP interface brief command to verify everything is correct. By assigning the 10.1.1.1 to gigabit ethernet 0 slash 1, this router will act as the default gateway for all edge devices connected to this network. Okay, so now that all the interface are configured and verified, it's time to set up OSPF so that our routers can dynamically share routing information. I'll start by switching the console connection back to router 1 to begin the OSPF configuration. Before configuring OSPF, let's take a look at Router 1 routing table using the show IP route command. As we can see, Router 1 knows about its directly connected networks. 192.168.10/24 is directly connected to Gigabit Ethernet 0/0. 192.168.20/24 0 is directly connected to Gigabit Ethernet 0 0/1. Hmm. But here's the issue. Router 1 has no idea about the 10.1.1.0 network, which is connected to Router 3. That means if Router 1 needs to send data to a device in that network, it has no route to get there. Let's fix that by configuring OSPF on all routers. I'll begin by entering OSPF router configuration mode with the following command router OSPF1. The number one here is the process ID. This is a local identifier for the OSPF process running on this router. Okay, so we need to advertise the networks that this router is directly connected to. This allows OSPF to share these networks with other routers in our setup. With this command, I'm telling router one to start sending its advertisement through its links. I'll enter the following commands. Before moving forward, let's take a quick moment to explain wildcard mask. In OSPF, instead of using a subname mask, we use a wildcard mask to specify which parts of the IP address we want OSPF to match. So, in the case of 0, 0, 0, 000255, the 0 means match exactly for that portion of the address, and the 255 means don't match anything for that part of the address. Now, what's area in OSPF? To make it simple, it's a logical grouping of routers. All OSPF routers must have a connection to this area for OSPF to function properly across multiple networks. By placing our networks in area zero, we're ensuring that OSPF can efficiently share routing information between all of our routers. Now, let's add our other network. Now that Router 1 is configured and sending hello packets, it's time to move on to Router 2 and set up OSPF there as well. I'm now on Router 2. Now let's check the routing table on Router 2 to see what network it knows about so far. As we can see, Router 2 only knows about its own local networks. Next, let's run the show IP interface brief command on Router 2 to quickly see which networks we need to add to OSPF. Now, we'll configure OSPF on Router 2 just like we did on Router 1. I'll start by entering OSPF configuration mode. Just like on Router 1, these commands tells Router 2 to advertise its 192.168.20 networks in OSPF and place them in Area 0, the backbone area. This ensures Router 2 can exchange routing information with other routers in the network. Check what happens now. This indicates that OSPF is completing the process of exchanging hello packets and establishing a full adjacency between the routers. 
when OSPF goes from loading to full, as you see here, it means that the routers have successfully formed a relationship and have completed the exchange of routing information. This is a good sign because it means they are now fully aware of each other's networks and can share routing updates. Now that we configure router 1 and router 2, it's time to switch over to router 3 and set it up for OSPF as well. Now we are on router 3. Let's run the show IP route command. As you can see, it knows about its local address that is directly connected to through G0 slash 1 and it also knows about its other local address that is directly connected to through G0 slash 0. Now, let's look at the networks that we'll be adding. We have our 10110 network and our 192.168.1.0 network. So let's add them now. And look at that, we formed full adjacency between the routers. Let's add our second network. Now that we've finished configuring router 3, we can see that all three routers have reached full adjacency and are successfully sharing routing information. This means all the routers now know about each other's networks. Instead of manually configuring each route, OSPF is taking care of all the routing decisions and updates automatically. Let's verify by starting with router 1. Now that we are back on router 1, let's scroll up and review the routing table from our previous command. As you can see, router 1 doesn't have any information about the 10110/24 network since we haven't configured OSPF yet. Now, let's run the show IP route command one more time. And there you have it. The O tells us this route was learned through OSPF. This is the network. The 110 represents the OSPF administrative distance and 2 represents the route's cost. This tells us router 1 can reach the 10110 network through 192.168.1.2. It provides the uptime of the connection as well as the interface used to reach that network. Let's switch over to router 2 and check out the routing table. We are on router 2. Now let's run the show IP route command on router 2. And there you have it. As you can see, Router2 now knows about the 10110/24 network and it has learned about the 192.168.10/24, the local network on Router1. Now, let's switch over to Router3. As you can see, Router2 has also learned about the 192.168.20.24 network via 192.168.11 through Gigabit Ethernet 0/0. Now, let's switch back to Router1 real quick to test the connectivity. I'm going to try pinging the 10.110.24 network and see if the route is working as expected. 
If everything is set up correctly, we should get a reply back showing that OSPF routing is working and all routers can communicate. Moment of truth. And there you have it. As you can see, the ping test was successful. The OSPF configuration is working as expected and all routers are now fully exchanging routing information and able to reach each other's networks. Now, let's save all of our configuration to make sure everything is persistent after a reboot. And there you have it, we successfully configured OSPF on all of our routers. If you found this video helpful and want to see more tutorials like this one, don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel. Don't forget to leave your comments below if you have any questions. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.